loving Lord, our Father and our great God, we want to thank you, Lord, for this wonderful opportunity of being up in the mountains with you, Lord, and hearing your wonderful words of life. We ask and pray, O oh Lord, that as you empower us, O oh Lord, and make us willing to be made willing to, be fall, to fall upon that rock, which is a stumbling stone, a stone of offense to many. We ask and pray, Lord, that you'll help us to be willing also to go and share these wonderful words with those, O oh Lord, who do not know. We ask and pray that you'll be with your manservant for this hour and that you'll overshadow him, O oh Lord, and that you'll grant him even more of your spirit to share these wonderful truths with us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I was trying to finish that presentation last time, but we just didn't, I just didn't get through it. But um, that means this presentation, we have a little bit of extra time. And um, <clears throat> as is always the case, um, there, uh, one of the questions, I don't know if it's always the case, but when I have opportunity to share Bible prophecy on a regular basis, one of the criticisms and some criticisms sometimes are construct constructive criticism and sometimes they're kind of mean-spirited criticism. So you get a variety of types. But one of the criticisms that will come up, no matter what the motivations of it are, is that uh, by presenting the more um, historical aspect of current Bible prophecy and at the same time saying that this is the present truth message, that you are really undermining the important message of the hour, which is the deeper levels of prophecy, which have to deal with personal experience. Um, and I'm going to try to give you an example of that. Um, I have one sister here that I know it's constructive criticism. This sister's been on our mailing list from the very beginning. She's we're friends. I'm not threatened by anything she's asking. She's, she's trying to sort this out, so don't read that into it. But she's asking a good question. I keep telling her, write up the question so we can deal with it. But I'm going to at least try to express a little of it for her here and for you so you can understand this question that gets raised about the prophetic message. I believe that we need to recognize the current events in the world as being identified in God's Word. We need to recognize from God's Word what's going on on planet Earth today, be able to see it in the current events, and I believe that's the message for Adventism in the world. We need to be the Daniel that's brought in before Belshazzar when the handwriting's on the wall, a crisis time right when Babylon's fallen, and no one knows what's going on. Daniel, representing God's people at the end of the world, he comes in and he says, uh, you know, I don't want none of your human glory, but I do know what that means. He's the one with the clarifying message about what's about to take place. Judgment's about over and you're lost, your kingdom's lost. So he's symbolizing us at the end of the world, and I believe that the prophetic message, the, the more gross, that's probably a bad word, but the, the fact that the, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union followed by the, the Sunday law in the United States followed by the conquering of the world, that that is the message. And, and the Lord uses that message for us to proclaim it to the world. He, he uses that message to awaken us. We see, yes, verse 40 was fulfilled in 1989. And what it implies is the next thing that happens in Bible prophecy is a Sunday law in the United States and probation closes and I'm not ready. And when I realize that and then I realize I'm not ready, then I need to seek, to, seek the Lord. But there's, there's much deeper and more important meanings to Bible prophecy. My personal frustration is, is you just, I never seem convicted to take the time and go there before I try to share with people, confirm what the, the more gross uh, areas of Bible prophecy are. I mean, I, I've seen an attack, a resistance to what is the glorious land, what is the king of the south, and I've spent my time trying to defend what the king of the north, the king of the south, the glorious land is, and I think it's important. I think it's important to be correct on that. So I just never have seemed to have the time to take it to the lower level. 
And if you turn with me to Daniel chapter 8, I'll try to illustrate this for you. This was, was humorous when it happened, but it was, uh, um, it was enlightening. I believe that Daniel chapter 7 is giving the kingdom's Bible prophecy from their political aspect with the beast being geopolitical kingdoms, but Daniel chapter 8 is giving us the kingdoms of Bible prophecy from their spiritual aspect. Um, that's why Daniel uses so many sanctuary terms in Daniel chapter 8. He's saying this is the kingdoms of Bible prophecy in their religious manifestations. And I believe because of this, this is one of the stumbling blocks uh, that people trip over in their misunderstanding of the daily in the book of Daniel. Because I, I believe there is a counterfeit uh, sacrificial service that takes place in Daniel chapter 8. So there is, there's, there is actually truth in there about a counterfeit sacrificial service uh, that, that people misunderstand and then they take the daily and say it represents Christ's work in the, most, in the sanctuary above and they're wrong. But I'm not dealing with that. I'm dealing with, with Daniel chapter 8. And there was a time when I was dealing with the daily in the country of Dominican Republic. And from my perspective, and, and, I, and I'm not being racist, I, I'm not being racist at all, but the Latin brethren are more emotional than American brethren. Okay, the, from my experience, I could be wrong. I'm not fully experienced in everything, but uh, you know, I, I've, seen, I've seen in the United States some people get frustrated with what I'm saying, and you know, they might tell me a thing or two, and then they're gone. But I've seen in South America when people get frustrated about what I'm teaching, they're, they're going to stay there and stand up and go at, at me until, until it's over. They're, they got a little bit more fire in their blood. I have to say that so you get the setting of this story. So we're in Dominican Republic, and uh, we have about 100 and, 100 and some people in a brother's big home. Big, it's one house, we're all in there. And uh, on the first floor here, if this is the first floor, is where we're having the meetings. It's about half the size of this room. And then it has, uh, on that room is two stories, and up there in that room is where the bedrooms are. So I spend all day long going through the daily. And there was people that didn't understand the daily in the book of Daniel, and I'm sharing with them that the daily in the book of Daniel is paganism. In general, pagan Rome specifically. And by the end of the day, all the brethren are saying, Amen. And we got done a little bit early. So the translator, a good friend of mine that translated that day, um, he, he was going to speak at that time, Tico. Most, many of you know Tico. And uh, so there was no reason for me to hang out down there because I don't understand enough Spanish. And plus, I might as well just go up there in the bedroom and just relax. And uh, I'm listening to Tico. He's, he's going to speak for an hour. And about 30 minutes in, I hear one brother raise his voice, another brother raises his voice. About 45 minutes, there's three or four people interrupting. About an hour and a half in, it's kind of getting almost push and shove with the voices. Two and a half hours, it's just commotion. And finally, Tico comes up. And I said, what went on down there? And this is what he told me. If you turn to Daniel chapter 8. Um, in in uh, verse uh, 4 it says, I saw a ram pushing westward and northward and southward so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. But he did according to his will and he became great. Every one of the beasts in Daniel 8 becomes great, exceedingly great. In fact, if you look closely, each of the beasts that come into Daniel, great, Daniel 8, the greatness, it escalates. And this word great is gadol. It means self-exaltation. Now remember, Daniel 8 is about the religious manifestations of the kingdoms of Bible prophecy. And one of the things that Daniel was teaching in Daniel 8 is that the the fundamental truth of the religious manifestations of the Medes and Persians and the Greeks and the Romans and the Papal Romans was self-exaltation and it only increased as history went on. And when you understand that, then you realize that the 
foundation, the bottom line of the daily, which is paganism, the very root of paganism is self-exaltation. So I had just spent the morning teaching the brethren that the daily was paganism and it was pagan Rome. So Tycho did the right thing. He said, well, I'm going to take this truth to the practical and important level. I'm going to let them know that if they still have self-exaltation in their heart, that they're a pagan. Of course, <laughs> Tycho would never say it that way. Tycho would never say it that way. That's how I just said it, to let you understand what was going on down there. And the brethren suddenly, they just figured out that the daily was paganism, and now suddenly someone's saying, if you're still holding on to an idol in your life, then you've got the daily in your heart. And they weren't receiving it well. And it took a long time, and it got very loud down there. And he came up and told me that story, and so I'm telling you that story for this reason. Correctly understood, all these prophetic truths go down to that level. That's, Russell's been getting much closer to that level than I have. That's what he's talking about in 1840 to 1844. There, there was two groups. The one group had all the group had the doctrines of Rome. The Millerites were Sunday keepers and they had other doctor, doctrines of Rome. Brother Dwayne showed me uh, an early article. What was it, 1847? 1850. In 1850, there was a, an Adventist article that was making a very strong case on why it's okay to eat pork. Swine's flesh. Swine's flesh. This is in one of our publications. The point being is that when we come to the 1840 to 1844 time period, all the people were carrying within their hearts and minds the doctrines and the teachings of Rome. But the Lord was coming down from heaven to bring light, to call people out of Rome. There was a, there was a testing time, a purification process is what Daniel 12 refers to. And the foolish virgins were going to hang on to that darkness of Rome. So all I'm saying is that yeah, he's getting down to that level. But without a doubt, without a doubt, all the prophetic truths go down to that level. And yes, that to me is the most important level. But you have to start with the building blocks for most people, particularly when we're dealing uh, with giving a message to what inspiration says is a Laodicean condition, which we're all in. You have to start with the building blocks. You have to let the Holy Spirit bring conviction that yes, what, there's, what we're seeing in the world today is a fulfillment of prophecy, and we're at this point. Wake up, and then when we wake up, we, we meet, need to make sure that we let the Holy Spirit remove all the gadol out of our experience, the self-exaltation. So. I, I acknowledge that out, out front, but I know that because we don't get to that level very often, that it, all, it, it many times causes a stumbling block for people. Uh, they're convinced that uh, what we're sharing is a denial of the message of a, a call for the experience that we need at this time. But I don't know how to get around that. I don't know how to get around it. We, ha we have to understand what the last six verses of Daniel are to such an extent that we can explain it to people that haven't come to understand it yet. And the dynamics of this message at this time is there's a lot of people that are fighting against this message. And it's such a message, you just can't let them win. You've got to make a defense for this message. This message is glorious and powerful and deep. And you can't just walk away from that kind of battle. You've got to stand there. And so it, it stays at that level, I admit. It stays at that level most of the time. Um, so are you saying that's where you're frustrated on this? No, I'm not frustrated. Well, I want to not say I'm not sure exactly what you... Well, I just know that, 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 there, that there are, there's a sister here, and many times there's people that are are frustrated with the material I present, the message. the message, because they don't think that I'm emphasizing or that I believe or that I agree with uh, that experience. And, okay, we'll do this briefly. I appreciate what Jeff's trying to say. Um, if we understand that Jesus is the center of all prophecy, 
and he reveals it because he loves us, then that should give us the more urgency to study that revealed prophecy that concerns our present truth. And then Jesus is in the center of it, and uh, self-exaltation would be pushed away, and then we would make sure that we're prepared to stand against opposition and wrath. Fourth, fourth testament, uh, fifth testament to the church, page 452. No, don't turn it off. Hand it back to Sister Peggy. Go backwards with it, Ron. Jeff, I just want to say that um, I'm not frustrated with your message. I think that there are two prongs to prophecy, and I, what you are preaching, I believe, is, is one of those prongs. And I know I, you do. And I don't feel frustrated with it, but I feel excited about it because of what I have been studying on the nature of Christ, and, and a correct understanding of the nature of Christ will give you a glimpse into the spiritual aspect of what you are preaching, and that's what I'm so excited about. I, I know that. I'm using you as a, uh, an opportunity to put this concern on the record. I'm not threatened by you. There's some people that are very militant coming at this message from that point of view. You're not militant. I know that we are like-minded. Is that it? Okay, I thought Dwayne might have. Don't say a word. Until you get that microphone. <clears throat> I spoke with uh, that sister Peggy yesterday at lunch, and we, w we discussed uh, some things about uh, sin. But we won't, I won't mention that. But anyway, in our discussion, and what Ron said is correct about Jesus being the center of all prophecy. But as a personal testimony from what I've heard so far, I'd like to say this. That I sat here in my chair about an hour ago, and Jesus, you know, I've read in... Uh, it may not be similar to Wagner's experience for why he saw what he did, but Wagner said one day that he saw the cross, and he said that he saw that Jesus had died for him. I sat here in my chair an hour ago, and Jesus showed me the cross, and he said, Dwayne, this is what it's all about. It's about that I've died for you, and I am coming to this world. That's the deeper part of this experience. Jesus wants to communicate to us that he has died for us and he's willing to show that to us if we're willing to understand what these prophecies are saying to us individually. He says it's a, it, it is a life and death issue, but it's a life and death issue between the Savior and the soul. <clears throat> for me, the only one here that has even a glimpse of how unworthy I am is probably Kathy. I, I know how unworthy I am. And what prophecy does for me is it confirms the power of God. You see how deep and profound his thoughts are and his power to bring things to pass that he recorded years ago and you get confronted, you're overwhelmed with that power and you say, I'm unworthy, and I'm weaker than the weak. But he's, he's telling me he has the power to finish the work in, that he started in me if I will but participate. I mean, there's a power uh, in understanding God's prophetic word uh, that can raise us um, from sin unto righteousness. But let's get back on track. Purification of God's church. Final part. We left off in, in the, we don't, I don't think we have many more waymarks to deal with. That's where we left off on that last quote. <clears throat> I, will, I want to point out for you, I know that you've heard it enough um, already to understand it, but just for the record, this is an important point as we continue moving towards the book of Revelation that this angel that comes down and gives a loud cry message, it's a parallel to the angel that comes down in Revelation 10 and brings about the midnight cry message. And Sister White makes it easy for us. This is Christ. Evangelism 693, 694, the power which stirred the people so mightily in 1844 movement will again be revealed. The third angel's message will go forth, not in whispered tones, but with a loud voice. 
During the loud cry, the church, aided by the providential interposition of her exalted Lord, will diffuse the knowledge of salvation so abundantly that light will be communicated to every city and town. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of salvation. So abundantly will the renewing spirit of God have crowned with success the intensely active agencies that the light of present truth will be seen flashing everywhere. It's going to happen. And I believe this is the message that gets flashed everywhere. And I believe that when you look closely at the history of 1840 to 1844 and see how Jesus fits in there when he comes down out of heaven with the little book in his hand, that one of the lessons is, that is taught there is that the revival period of 1840 to 44 was brought about when the message was understood. This is pointing forward to the angel of Revelation 18. So, when you reach the time period when the message for the end of the world is beginning to be understood, then it means that the angel has come down. It's an argument, a sound argument, that we are in the latter rain time period as we speak. Now we look around, and humanly, humanly, you know, you can make an argument that we're not there, but inspiration says we're there. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, 429, 430, History Repeated. The angel who unites with the proclamation of the third message is to lighten the whole earth with his glory. A work of, world, a work of worldwide extent and unwanted power is here brought to view. The Advent movement of 1840 to 44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first message was carried to every mission station in the world. And in this country, there was the greatest religious interest which has been witnessed in any land since the Reformation of the 16th century. But these are to be far exceeded by the mighty movement under the loud cry of the third message. The work will be similar to that of the day of Pentecost. That's where we're at. It's about ready to go forward. This time period after the Sunday Law, is, we're dealing with waymarks. This is the time period after, immediately after the Sunday Law that the latter rain is poured out without measure. It begins to be poured out in its sprinkling. We read the quote, it's falling on hearts all around us, but they will not discern or recognize its manifestation. There's a time period when it begins to fall, when the wheat and tares are still together. That's the time period we're in now because the wheat and tares are separated when? Sunday. Sunday law. And then the Lord has a purified bride and he can pour out his spirit without measure upon her and empowered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does at least two important things. It empowers us to proclaim the loud cry message and to stand during the time period when there is no intercession for sin. So those are waymarks. Those are historical events that we're on the verge of seeing take place. Now the next one we want to point out, very significant one, is that it's after the Sunday law in the United States that Satan begins to personate Christ. Revelation 13, 11 through 14. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake his dragon, and he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them to dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he make fire come down from heaven on earth inside of men. Where do we get that? Um, what phrase, that phrase, where does it take us to? Mar Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel. Remember that, because uh, when we're going to identify the United States as the false prophet, it's, this is the, the hook in Revelation 13 that allows us to, to hang the false prophet, the priest of Baal, um, on the United States of America. So that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth inside of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do inside of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the, sword, the wound by the sword and did live. Testimonies, Volume 5, page 451. By the de decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness, 
when Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, when under the th influence of this threefold union our country r shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, then, notice the when then there, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. If we go back, that's just what Revelation 13 was saying. The United States speaks as a dragon in verse 11. What is the speaking? It's the action of the legislative and judicial authorities. When the Sunday law is passed, when the United States speaks, then we see the United States portrayed as deceiving the whole world. And that's just what Sister White says. When the United States clasps hands with these powers at the Sunday law, then the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan. During this time period, from here onward, is the marvelous working of Satan. Um, Satan is allowed to continue to, do, to masquerade as Christ until human probation closes. We have a quote where Sister White says he's allowed to, uh, we'll read it, I'm sure it's on here. He's allowed to perform his miracle until the end of probation. Servants of God, with their face lighted up and shining with holy consecration, will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given, miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and signs and wonders will follow the believers. Satan also works with lying wonders, even bringing down fire from heaven inside of men. Revelation 13, 13. Thus the inhabitants of the earth will be brought to take their stand. Who is it that brings fire down, out of her, fire down to earth out of heaven? Satan, she just said so. And here we see the United States um, bringing fire down out of heaven. It's at this time that Satan appears and begins his marvelous work and he is working through the United States of America to deceive the world. And the, the reason for the deception is what? What is he going to force them to do? To set up an image of the beast. That's what the, the deception accomplishes. Um, when Jesus was on earth, Satan led the people to reject the Son of God and choose Barabbas. What's Bar mean? Son, son of. What's Abba? Father. Barabbas was a false Christ. When Jesus was on earth, Satan led the people to reject the Son of God and choose Barabbas, who in character represented Satan, the God of this world. The Lord Jesus Christ came to dispute the usurpation, usurpation of Satan in the kingdoms of the world. The conflict is not yet ended, and as we draw near the close of time, the battle waxes more intense. As the second appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ draws near, satanic agencies are moved from beneath. Satanic agencies are moved from beneath. There's the quote I've referred to a couple times, couldn't quite draw to my memory, not because I wanted to speak about it, because, but because Russell's been speaking about it. There was satanic agencies coming up in the 1840-44 time period while the power of heaven was coming down. And where were they meeting at? Where were these, the one coming up and the one coming down meeting at? They were meeting at Carmel making the people make a choice. And it happens again. In our time period, once again, there's going to be satanic agencies coming up at the very same time that the angel of Revelation 18 is coming down. The conflict is not yet ended. As we draw near the close of time, the battle waxes more intense. As the second appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ draws near, satanic agencies are moved from beneath. Satan will not only appear as a human being, but he will personate Jesus Christ and the world that has rejected the truth will receive him as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. This time period here, we have more to say about this. Uh, the, the, the prophetic theme, I mean, there's pro several themes running through here and they're worth, they're worth uh, identifying. At the Sunday Law, national apostasy is followed by national ruin. What's going to happen here in the United States is, be, is human pen cannot describe. That's, that's what we've been told. That everything falls apart. And what do they say about most of the world economically in relation to the United States? They say this. If the United States sneezes, the rest of the world gets a cold. So as national apostasy hits the United States, this is impacting the whole world. The whole world is being brought into this crisis situation. And at the same time, what happens? 
Satan appears. And the world thinks he's Christ. But he is paralleling the story of Barabbas. This is, this is represented in the story of Barabbas during the time period of Christ. And uh, at this time, the latter rain is falling on God's people. We're, we have a, a crisis situation ahead of us to, if we're faithful and we get to proclaim this message, it's going to be in some of the most intense time that we can't even imagine it. Manuscript releases number 12, page 149, the soul that has had light in regard to the Lord's Sabbath, his memorial of creation, and to save himself from inconvenience and reproach has chosen to remain disloyal, has sold his Lord. He has dishonored the name of Christ. He has taken his stands, stand with the armies of Antichrist. Those who apostatize leave the truth and f- true and faithful people of God and fraternize with those who represent Barabbas. By their fruit ye shall know them. Barabbas is the symbol of the time period when Satan is personating Christ. It, he is a symbol of the time period when the whole world is choosing either Christ or Antichrist. There's a choice, there's a separation going on. The final separation. There can be only two classes. Each party is distinctly stamped, either with the seal of the living God or with the mark of the beast or his his image. Each son and daughter of Adam chooses either Christ or Barabbas as his general. All who place themselves on the side of the disloyal are standing under Satan's black banner and are charged with rejecting and despitefully using Christ. They are charged with deliberately crucifying the Lord of life and glory they're charged with deliberately crucifying Christ, and she's talking about the armies of Barabbas or the armies of Satan, but when, when you run Barabbas in the CD-ROM and see all that she has to say about it, um, you'll find that the, the evil confederacy of Isaiah 8, which is also the evil confederacy of the ten kings of Revelation 17, that they are also represented as Barabbas and that they also oppose Christ. Revelation 17 says they make army against the Lamb and his followers. And how does this Barabbas, Satan, Ten King army war against Christ? By attacking Christ's people on earth. This is describing the persecution that's carried out, and there will be a bloodbath. Here's the one um, that defines when the work of Barabbas comes to an end. We are warned that in the last days he will work with signs and lying wonders, and he will continue these wonders until the close of probation, that he may point to them as evidence that he is an angel of light and not of darkness. The time period from here, the Sunday law, until Michael stands up, is the time period that Satan is allowed to personate Christ. It's the time period that is symbolized uh, by Barabbas. The false Christ, Bar, son of Abba's father. At the Sunday law, judgment begins with the house of God. God's church is purified. One of the way marks that takes place here is that God's children that are outside of Adventism will then um, be called to come and stand with God's people. Many who have not known the truth have corrupted their way before God and have departed from the faith. The broken ranks will be filled up by those represented by Christ as coming in at the eleventh hour. There are many with whom the Spirit of God is striving. The time of God's destructive judgments. What's the time of God's destructive judgments? National apostasy is followed by national ruin. Now Everything's progressive. Sister White says the judgments of God are already in the land. What's going on in the world today, those are the judgments of God. But at the Sunday law, the judgments of God escalate to a new level. This is the time of God's destructive judgments. But, it, but we know this isn't the time of the seven last plagues because in this passage that we'll finish reading, probation's still open. Seven last plagues, probation's closed. The time of God's destructive judgment here is a time of mercy for those of out, outside of Adventism because probation is still open for them. The time of God's destructive judgment is a time of mercy for those who have, not, have no opportunity to learn what is truth Tenderly will the Lord look upon them. His heart of mercy is touched. His hand is stretched out to save. This is important. You'll find places in the spirit of prophecy and in the Bible 
where this hand is worth watching. Um, at the Sunday Law in the United States, the people in Babylon, they escape the hand of the papacy. But when you bring this text together, where do they go? They go into the hand of Christ. It's a, from one hand to another. Tenderly the Lord, will the Lord look upon him. His heart of mercy is touched. His hand is still stretched out to save while the door is closed to those who would not enter. Large numbers will be admitted who in these last days hear the truth for the first time. Have Seventh-day Adventists heard the truth? Yes, they've heard the truth. This isn't them. This is the people that haven't heard the truth before. They're going to hear it for the first time. I saw that the Holy Sabbath is and will be the separating wall between the true Israel of God and unbelievers and that the Sabbath is the great test question to unite the hearts of God's dear waiting saints. If one believed and kept the Sabbath and received the blessing attending it and then gave it up, who's that? That's Seventh-day Adventists. They believed in the Sabbath, but for some reason they gave it up. If one believed and kept the Sabbath and received the blessing attended it and then gave it up and broke the Holy Commandment, then they would shut the gates of the holy city against themselves. What's the shutting of the gates? It's the closing of the door. It's the close of probation. They'd shut the gates of the holy city against themselves as sure as there is a God that rules in heaven above. I saw that God had children who do not see and keep the Sabbath. They have not rejected the light on it. And at the commencement of the time of trouble, and I'm sure we're all familiar with it when this quote is in early writings, that in the back of early writings, um, they explain that this time of trouble is here. She, this is Sister White specific, she's talking about a time of trouble when probation is still open. This is what we as Adventists call the little time of trouble. Sister White never uses the phrase little time of trouble, but it's accurate. It works. This is the little time of trouble that precedes the great time of trouble. It's a time period of God's destructive judgments. It's a time period of national apostasy being, the, the, being followed by national ruin. It's a time period when Satan is personating Christ, fulfilling his role as Barabbas. And it's a time of mercy for these people who have never known the Sabbath truth. At the commencement of the time of trouble, the little time of trouble, we were filled with the Holy Ghost. When are we filled with the Holy Ghost? when the latter rain is poured out at the Sunday law, the commencement of this time of trouble, at the beginning of the little time of trouble, that's the Sunday law, that's the commencement. That's when we're filled with the Holy Ghost. Filled with the Holy Ghost as we went forth to proclaim the Sabbath more fully. When we go forth to proclaim the more Sabbath more fully in the latter rain, is that, is that consistent with what we understand the final warning message to be? Yes, that's the message. That's the message. This enraged the church and nominal Adventists as they could not refute the Sabbath truth. And at this time, God's chosen all saw clearly that we had the truth and they came out and endured the persecution with us. Now, of course, of course, that last statement, that's a real hard statement for people um, that view that the glorious land in Daniel 11.41 is the Seventh-day Adventist church. Because when you start looking at verse 41 and you're calling the glorious land the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you just really get yourself in a big dilemma about the people that are coming out of the hand of the papacy and they're coming, where are they going? Because they, they can't be going into the Seventh-day Adventist Church because it just got conquered by the papacy. And here it says that they came out and joined, brothers and sisters, the glorious land in verse 41 of Daniel 11 is not the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It doesn't fit. The logic just breaks down. It breaks down. And if you don't think it breaks down, we have a set of tapes from Oklahoma and you can watch the, break, the breakdown of that logic right on video. There are diligent students of the word of prophecy in all parts of the world who are obtaining light and still greater light from searching the scriptures. This is true of all nations, of all tribes, and all peoples. These will come from the grossest error and will take the places of those who have had opportunities and privileges and have not prized them. Who is it in the writings of Ellen White that have had great light and opportunities? It's Seventh-day Adventists. They will take the places of those who have had opportunities and privileges and have not prized them. These have worked out their own salvation with fear and trembling lest they become deficient in doing the ways and will of God while those who have had great light have, through perversity of their own natural hearts, turned away from Christ because displeased with the requirements. 
But God will not be left without witnesses. The one-hour laborers will be brought in at the eleventh hour and will consecrate ability and all their entrusted means to advance the work. These will receive the reward for their faithfulness because they are true to principle and shun not their duty to declare the whole counsel of God. When those who have had abundance of light throw off the restraint which the word of God imposes and make void his law, others will come in to fill their places and take their crown. Even those supposed to be heathen will choose the side of Christ, while those who become offended, as did the disciples, will go away and walk no more with him, and others will come in and occupy the place they have left vacant. The time is very near when man shall have reached the prescribed limits. The record of their works in the books of heaven is weighed in the balances and found wanting. At the Sunday law, the eleventh hour laborers, the one hour workers, God's other children in Babylon, all these phrases are identifying the, the God's children that are still in Babylon that come out during that time and stand with God's people. That's in this time period. <clears throat> Ultimately, the last of those people make their choice and Michael stands up. And because of room, I left out Daniel 12 verse 1. Let's put it on there for the record before we read the rest of the quote. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be written in the book. When this time of trouble comes, every case is decided. There is no longer probation. No longer mercy for the impenitent. The seal of the living God is upon his people. This small remnant, unable to defend themselves in the deadly conflict with the powers of earth that are marshaled by the dragon host, make God their defense. The decree has been passed by the highest earthly authority that they shall worship the beast and receive his mark under pain or persecution and death. May God help his people now, for what can they, they then do in such a fearful conflict without his assistance? This way mark is when human probation closes. It's when Michael stands up. And then there are a few other way marks. The seven last plagues. I saw that the four angels would hold the four winds until Jesus' work was done in the sanctuary, and then will come the seven last plagues. These plagues enraged the wicked against the righteous. They thought that we had brought the judgments of God upon them, and if they could rid the earth of us, the plagues would then be stayed. A decree went forth to slay the saints, which caused them to cry day and night for deliverance. This was the time of Jacob's trouble. There's another way mark. Uh, the seven last plagues, a way mark. But the time of Jacob's trouble is a way mark in the midst of the seven last plagues. Then all the saints cried out with anguish of spirit and were delivered by the voice of God. The 144,000 triumphed. Their faces were lighted up with the glory of God. Then I was shown a company who were howling in agony. On their garments was written in large characters, Thou weighed in the balance and found one. I asked who this company were. The angel said, These are they who, had once, who have once kept the Sabbath and have given it up. I heard them cry with a loud voice, We have believed in thy coming and taught it with energy. And while they were speaking, their eyes would fall upon their garments and see the writing, and then they would wail aloud. I saw that they had drunk of the deep waters and fouled the residue with their feet, trodden the Sabbath underfoot. And that was why they were weighed in the balances and found wanting. The Death Decree The heavenly sentinels, faithful to their trust, continue their watch. Though a general decree has, been, has fixed the time when commandment keepers may be put to death, their enemies will in some cases anticipate the decree and before the time specified will endeavor to take their lives. But none can pass the mighty guardians stationed about every faithful soul. Some are assailed in their flight from the cities and villages, but the swords raised against them break and fall as powerless as a straw. Others are defended by angels in the form of men of war. Jacob's trouble. Jacob and Esau represent two classes. Jacob the righteous and Esau the wicked. Jacob's distress when he learned that Esau was marching against him with 400 men represents the trouble of the righteous as the decree goes forth to put them to death just before the coming of the Lord. 
As the wicked gather about them, they will be filled with anguish, for like Jacob, they can see no escape for their lives. The angel placed himself before Jacob, and he took hold of the angel and held him and wrestled with him and all night. So also will the righteous in their time of trouble and anguish wrestle in prayer with God as Jacob wrestled with the angel. Jacob in his distress prayed all night for deliverance from the hand of Esau. The righteous in their mental anguish will cry to God day and night for deliverance from the hand of the wicked who surround them. About four months since I had a vision of events all in the future, I saw the time of trouble such as never was. Jesus told me it was the time of Jacob's trouble and that we should be delivered out of it by the voice of God. Then I saw the four angels cease to hold the four winds and I saw famine, pestilence and sword. Nation rose against nation and the whole world was in confusion. Then we cried to God day and night for deliverance until he, we began to hear the bells on Jesus' garment. And I saw Jesus rise up from the holiest. And as he came out, we heard the tinkling of the bells and knew that our high priest was coming out. When does he come out? On this, on this here. Right here, right? Human, Michael stands up, human probation closes. So she's talking about, right now she's talking about right here, right? I saw Jesus rise up in the holiest and as he came out, we heard the tinkling of the bells and knew that our high priest was coming out. Then we heard the voice of God, which shook the heavens and the earth and gave the 144,000 the day and hour of Jesus' coming. Then the saints were free, united and full of glory of God, for he had turned their captivity. And I saw a flaming cloud come where Jesus stood. Then Jesus laid off his priestly garment and put on his kingly robe and took his place on the cloud which carried him to the east, where it first appeared to the saints on earth, a small black cloud which was a sign of the Son of Man. While the cloud was passing from the holiest to the east, which took a number of days, the synagogue of Satan worshipped at the feet of the saints. I'm not trying to set any time prophecy, but I, I, let's understand that the, the time reference about Christ coming out of this sanctuary when it's over and coming back to get his waiting saints, it's not portrayed as weeks, months, or years. It's portrayed as days. The issue's over at that point, and Christ wants to be with us more than we want to be with Him. So He's ready to come get us. Um, it's going to be severe, it's going to be extreme, um, but the time of trouble, we do not have evidence it's, that it's the great time of trouble. We don't have any evidence that it's going to be years. Um, our next study, we will begin to take up what I'm convicted is the message of the hour, Daniel 11. And we will take a great deal of time of it, with it. Hopefully we've set forth um, enough <coughs> principles of Bible prophecy that we can uh, manage this study clearly and uh, concisely. And hopefully now we have a little bit of a, a framework of what we should expect to see at the end of the world and see how that uh, fits in to Daniel 11. And uh, I have, by my estimation, 12 minutes left. So is there any questions on the purification of God's church? But do, raise your hand if you have one, and we'll get the mic to you. Dwayne has one. On the... Uh the reference on page 9 of, of the section where it's entitled History Repeated. The comment says, The angel who unites in the proclamation of the third message is to lighten the whole earth with his glory. A work of worldwide extent and unwanted power is here brought to view. The Advent movement of 1840-44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first message was carried to every missionary station in the world. And in this country, there was the greatest religious interest which has been witnessed in any land since the Reformation of the 16th century. But these are to be far exceeded, she says, by the mighty movement under the loud cry of the third message. Uh, the work will be similar to that of the day of Pentecost. In Pentecost, in the book of Acts, the work there that was is laid out for us is the work went to the Jews first and then to the world. So my question is, is if within its similarity to, to Pentecost, what we've discussed so far in the last two days is that at Sunday Law, the church 
if rightly represented by the Jewish church, if you, if you take them to represent us at the end of the world, then where's the similarity between Pentecost going to the Jews and then to the world? Well, that... Do you follow me? Yeah, uh, I, think I, ha I know what my answer is. I don't know that it will satisfy you, but we have a, a study called The Judgment of the Living. And one of the purposes of the judgment of the living is to identify that judgment is progressive. And uh, all of these issues, virtually all of these issues are progressive. And, and we deal with that in the judgment of the living. The, the, the progression of Protestant America accepting more and more of Catholicism and lifting up Catholicism, it's a progression. Uh, the judgments that are taking place in the world today, they're progressively getting greater. They get greater national policy followed by national ruin. They get even greater at the seven last plagues. All of it's progressive, including the judgment. And uh, this is a, a very sound truth, biblical truth. And, and I say biblical, you can show a progressive judgment in the Bible. The spirit of prophecy makes it a lot simpler. But in, through the time that we've shared this, this teaching, um, of course, you always receive opposition. So the judgment of the living was one of the attempts to try to set forth the answer to the opposition. And the time period of Christ is one of the best histories in the Bible to show a progressive uh, uh, close of judgment. I mean, if, if you look closely, you can find that judgment was closing upon the Jews when Jesus stood in the temple when he was 12 years old. There was a the process of the close of probation was taking place. And uh, you can follow it all the way up to where you can, you can see that probation closed at the cross. The probation closed at the stoning of Stephen. Um, it was a, a progression of, the, of a process of the close of probation that was taking place. And at the same time, it was paralleling the judgment. It was giving an illustration of the final judgment. And the final judgment begins with the church. Judgment begins in the house of God. So the, the test comes to us first. It moves out in the world. The, the latter rain time period is paralleling Pentecost. The gospel's going to the Gentiles. Um, am I answering your question? No. Okay. I, the one point I, I, I have to know is, is that at Pentecost, the, the disciples, after having replaced Judas, they came together and they prayed. And... Uh, they were all together in one place, and when the Holy Spirit came on upon them, that day in Jerusalem, when 3,000 souls were baptized, uh, does that paint for us a picture of the sprinkling just prior to the latter rain? For, no, that, because that, goes, that is the latter rain. But that's done for the Jewish church in Jerusalem. By that time, the Sunday law has come, and probation is closed for Adventists, so how can it... How, how can you have that d done for, if it's similar? Now, in, unless, she, unless she doesn't mean exactly but, but, similar. But, well, there is a way that that's even portrayed. But, and you, you know, I, you think, I think we passed over something in here. Did we read the quote where the two quotes were first the United States and the nations of the globe, follow her example? We read that last night. Okay. Right. The, the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the United States is going to be judged first. But there's still Adventists to be judged. And on Pentecost, those Jews you're talking about, where, where were most of them from? The world. Other parts of the world. Other parts of the world. But I don't know if that's answering your question, but it's a progressive close of probation, and uh, you, can, you can easily line up, and he, he wants to respond to it, but you can easily line up the Sunday law with the cross. But let's see what... Um, well, as, as, the, um, as the test comes to the United States first, um, don't forget the cleansing of the sanctuary. It is God's church that is being cleansed first. So the test comes to, uh, you know, as the, as the truth swells within Adventism, the ranks of Adventism, you know, this is, this is parallel in the you know, outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and it's doing the work of cleansing within the church. And then um, that moves over to the churches in, 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 in the world. Then... You know, it, its work is done both in, in the churches in the United States of America, then the rest of the world. Then at the loud cry, the same process that took place in the church takes place in the world. 
I have a answer for the people that think this is instead of talking about the righteousness of Christ, because there's nothing like realizing how close probation is to make you think about Christ and your relationship to him and what's going to take to get yourself character ready. And that makes you think of the law. And the law is nothing but the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the law is the righteousness of Christ. And we look to the law and make ourselves as much like Jesus Christ as we can with the whole help of the Holy Spirit. And that's the way I see that problem. Jamal. In regards to the last part of the quote, uh, the work will be similar to that of the day of Pentecost. Are we talking about the nature or the events of Pentecost? Both. Both. I, uh, for me, it's both. And I, you know, I've had people go af- after me on that. They want to say that it's always the nature. It's, it's the moral lesson, but it's not the events. I think it's both. I, I think sometimes the, the histories that we look at and we bring them down to the end of the world, we don't fully, fully recognize their alignment initially, perhaps, perhaps never. You know, I think the Lord's willing to reveal those things. But uh, there's enough evidence within them to know that you're in the right place. Um, Peggy. I just wanted to comment. Um, On page 13, we read a quote where Mrs. White says, "Um, I was shown a company who were howling in agony on their garments was written in large characters. Thou art weighed in the balance and found wanting. I asked who this company were, and the angel said, These are they who have once kept the Sabbath and have given it up. I I heard them cry with a loud voice, We have believed in thy coming and taught it with energy. These are people who believe that they are sincerely following the truth and on um, if on the page before that she said it says when those who have had abundance of light throw off the restraint which the word of God imposes and make void his law others will come in to fill their places and take their crown this is the same group who um, taught the coming of Christ with um, with energy and it's the law of God even within the church and I find it, what I have been finding as I've studied this that it has to do with how we understand the nature of Christ. It's, it's so interrelated that we must understand that, um, that topic correctly. Okay, let's uh, have a word of prayer. We are, time is running out on planet Earth and on this videotape. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the light that you've given us. Uh, We ask that you would bless us with wisdom and discernment to correctly understand this light and how it applies to this day and age. And we acknowledge um, that we need to use this information to better understand you and become completely like you, that uh, through our personal experience, people can be uh, come to know you and be warned about what's about to, to take place on planet Earth. And we thank you for the time we've had together so far. We ask you to continue to be with us in this prophecy school. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>